Hi, I'm Claudia Sam, and in this video, I am going to share with you my advice on writing research papers. I'm going to talk specifically about research papers in economics with a particular focus on the papers that PhD students write as they go onto the job market. So let me go ahead and share my slides. All right. Okay. So like I said, we're going to talk about writing. First, good writing matters. It really does. You should put the time into it. The most important reason that writing matters is that is the way that we reach the goal of research itself. The reason we do research, the reason we spend the time to answer questions about the economy, about what's happening in our world, is to create knowledge. We are trying through our work to expand the frontier of what is known. At the end, to do so, you must communicate what you have learned. I know you have all learned something. By the time you have spent the hours, the weeks, the years, on your research, you have learned a lot. But if that stays inside of your head, if you do not share that with others, then that knowledge hasn't been created and can't be built upon. So when you're writing, the goal is to get your knowledge out to the world. Okay, so you're all writing research papers. You know this, you gotta write them. That's the way you're gonna get a job. What you need to understand is doing it well can really make that, that transfer of knowledge happen easily, right? Or, or it can make it happen at all, right? So research is complex. You know that. You've learned a lot. It took you a lot of time to figure out what you know, what you don't know. So when you are communicating that research, make it easy for the reader to understand what you found and why it is important. Don't make them work, right? So that's your job. As the researcher, as the writer, you have to get your message across. An important benefit of good writing, clear writing, is it will help avoid confusion and misinterpretation. Sometimes that happens, even though you have worked very hard to make your, your work clear. And yet, a lot of those uncomfortable experiences can be avoided if you put a little extra time into your communication. A big benefit of people understanding your research as it was intended to be understood is you stay in control, right? This is your research. You don't want people rewriting your research in their head, right? This is your research and you are the expert. And as the expert, the responsibility is on you to communicate your expertise. Okay, good writing matters. Now, special features of job market papers, right? Because for many of you, this is the first research paper you have written that's really going to be important in your career. So when you are on the job market and applying for positions, whether they are in academia or government institutions or in the private sector, most of your readers, most of the people on the hiring committee will be from different subfields. They will not have the subject matter expertise that you do coming out of graduate school. Do not use subject area specific jargon. You're going to use some of it. That's okay. You're showing you're an expert. When you use jargon, you must explain it first, right? So we know what that jargon means. Do not assume the reader is an expert. Now, you will have subject matter experts reading your paper. On hiring committees, it's very important to have someone read the paper to make sure the substance is solid. Good writing will not get you to the finish line. It will help you get there, 
but the substance is what matters, right? And so the, your subject matter experts are gonna read your whole paper. The technical needs to be very solid in the full paper. Everybody else is going to read only parts of your paper. Most will read the abstract, the introduction, and tables and charts. Those are the parts of the paper that you need to be particularly aware that the language, the communication is accessible to a wide range of economists, not just in your field, and that those pieces hang together, are communicated well without having to read the body of the paper. Like you get it, what the point is. The last thing about job market papers, and this is reality, this is not meant to get you more anxious than you already are. Calm down, it'll, it'll be okay, I promise you. The job market paper is basically your resume. This is the way that we economists who are already out in the world are going to understand who you are, what kind of questions you work on, what kind of skills you bring out of graduate school. So the, the job market paper is a way that you are telling the economics world who you are. That's a special situation. Research papers in general after that are much more focused on in this particular case, what's the question I'm asking, what's the answer, why is it important, right? They're a little less about who am I? Okay, always your research is going to be your currency in the profession, right? Research and papers are valued differently in different parts of the profession, but that that's, something that shows the body of your scholarship. So you're always gonna write, want to, to write well. The job market paper is special and that it, it gives a fuller picture. So let's think of this as an opportunity. Your job market paper allows you to tell a fuller story of who you are, the skills you bring, where you're headed in your, your career as a researcher convey your awesomeness. Use this opportunity to make sure people know who you are and who you are on track to become as a scholar. Okay, so now I'm gonna to get to the structure. So this is the meat of the talk. I'm going to give you specific parts of the abstract and the introduction. These are very closely related. I'll talk a little bit later about the very fine differences between abstract and introduction. This is not, a hard and fast formula. I'm not giving you rules, I'm giving you advice. This advice is not just mine, it comes from my listening to advice from other very senior members of the profession. You wanna write well, read good writing. Listen to people who are good writers. And then you make your own decision, right? This, is, this isn't gonna work for everybody. I think it's, it's very useful for people who are early in their careers, of writing research papers. Your research is about the substance. So it's okay if you just get the pieces in a very standard order, because then it's clear. Later in your career, you can learn flourishes and develop your own writing style. But that's not what we're here for. We're here for the economics, but to understand the economics, you gotta write it clearly. Okay, first part, of abstracts and introductions, the motivation. Why is your question important? Set the stage with facts. Do not tell us it's important. Give us a sense of why it's important. You want to make this as tailored to your research question. In our research, it's always better to be as specific as we can be as opposed to as general as we can be. So you wanna make sure the motivation is going to motivate your particular research question. Get us excited. Why am I excited to read this paper? Second, you must have a clearly articulated research question. A research question should be something that you can think of as having a question mark at the end. It is very precisely defined. It does not have and in it, right? If you have three different questions, you have three different papers. 
one paper. <laughs> one question, one paper. Don't make it too complex. It's already going to be a lot of information for people to absorb. So have a research question, have it be specific. Now, you don't have to write, my paper poses the question, yada, yada, with a question mark. Very commonly, we see my paper studies, my paper explores, I ask whether. Okay, so you, you have ways to turn the question into a sentence with a period, but you ought to be able to clearly articulate a question, right? It's really, really important. And the question should be the question you answer. Do not bait and switch. Don't tell me you're gonna do one thing and then you do another. Just be straight up. This is what I do. Here's the question I'm gonna answer. The next thing that we should see in terms of the structure is your contribution. I'll talk more about contributions shortly, but this is one of the two most important parts of your paper, of your research. You need to be able to tell us what will answering your question teach us. My paper contributes to our understanding of. Your contribution is not an estimate. It's not GDP grew by 4% according to my estimates. No, you're telling us something about, teaching us something about the way the factors that affect GDP growth, right? For example, so I want you to tell us, before you tell us what you found, tell us what the answer to your question, what the findings are going to contribute to the body of knowledge, okay? It's really important that you focus on your contribution, not the contributions of others whom you are building on. Come back to that again. This is really important. So tell me what you're going to teach us in terms of understanding. Okay. Now, the last three parts of the structure. So you'll describe your methods. How do you answer the question? Explain your identification, the key features of your approach. This could be where you explain what you have for data, what you do with the data, do you do a model, a simulation? Tell me how you're going to get to the answer. Here's a place where We'll probably see some jargon, jargon that is defined, right? We want to be able to place in people's minds what kind of methods you're using. Here, clarity can be very helpful because I need, I need to understand what you did. This is a confidence building part of the paper. I, I'm only going to care about your findings if I think like the way you got there is a good way. Right, so take some time, describe your methods. Don't, don't take like all the time on methods. Get it clear, concise, and show us that you know what you're doing and show us the skills that you have at the point you're writing this paper. Okay, so we get the methods. Now, results. This is the most important part of your paper. The contribution is really, really important, particularly when you're trying to get papers published. Always results are important. This is the knowledge you created. This is why I'm reading the paper. What am I going to learn from you? Make sure that this part of the paper gets your the most attention from you as writing and the most real estate in the paper. This is why we're here. So in the results section, you're gonna tell us what you found. Share your main findings. More than three is gonna to get to be an overload in the abstract and the introduction. You can very well have additional points and findings that you talk about in the body of the paper. A good reason to limit it and not, it doesn't have to be three, it could be one result, right? A good reason to limit it some is you need in all the times you communicate the results, whether it's presentations or interviews, 
you need to be able to articulate what's the most important finding. What's the next one? So that's, this is a discipline. Good writing, good structure also is a way to discipline your thinking. This is good. Um, <clears throat> so you will, and the results, you're gonna tell us what you found, share the findings. It's very important to be clear and specific. Specific for us means some numbers, okay? Uh, tell me the main numbers. Only report things that are statistically significant. Don't put standard errors here. Tell me, tell me the numbers, set them in context. Is this a big number? Is this a small number? Uh, sometimes qualitatively can be enough to say this group of individuals had a much larger response to X than this other group, right? So, but you need, there needs to be some meat on the bones here, right? Because again, remember some people might not read your whole paper, right? So, that, but everybody needs to understand what you found. Okay, so that's, that's really important for each find, like make sure you give yourself the space to explain what you found. And then the last paragraph in papers is what's referred to as the roadmap. This only shows up in the introduction, not in the abstract. Here, don't get fancy. This is just in the next section I do X and the section after that I do Y. Like just give us the roadmap and move on. So that, those six pieces, that's what we will see and should see in research papers in the abstract and the introduction. Um, there are some variations on this, obviously. Uh, one that I have heard is that after the results section and before the roadmap, you, you will see papers increasingly that add a paragraph on robustness checks. Uh, this is one really for job market papers. If you don't do this, it's okay. Uh, but this would be a place where you elevate the most important robustness check uh, that you that you did in the paper. And that's just there to reinforce the results I've just told you about, they're legit, right? So um, anyways, that's one variation. And then again, these are not rules. This is just my advice, uh, but it's good advice. <laughs> um, okay, so as I alluded to before, but we are going to you know really drive this one home the most important parts of your paper are the contributions and the findings. It is your job to make them shine, right? Like I have got to, when I get done re reading your paper, know, and I as a reader should be able to articulate what's the contribution of this paper, what's the findings. So really important, take the time. It's worth it to invest time in these. Now, when you talk about contributions. And I mention this because I have, over the past two years, given detailed comments on the writing in over 40 job market papers and macro. I've run this writing workshop twice. Every time that I look at a junior scholar's research paper, a draft of it, I see this mistake. I know why you do it, but you, you just can't. So there's a part of the paper, I can usually find it. I've got a hunt usually, but I can find the contribution. Unfortunately, when I find it, there'll be a paragraph that the contribution is in, but the first, the first sentence of the paragraph will be so-and-so more senior economist in their research found. I, and then maybe a sentence, maybe you tell me about more senior people and what they found and why it's important. And then I get, and I contribute to this literature by extending their work in XYZ way. Okay, so whenever I find that sentence lurking in the third or fourth part of a paragraph, I take it and I move it to the top. My paper contributes to our understanding of X. My work expands on the findings, the modeling, the whatever it is that somebody before you contributed. You lead and then you set your results, your contributions in the context of others, right? If I wanna read their paper, I'll go get it. I wanna know 
your contributions. So it's really important. It can be a little scary, but it's really important to put you out there, front and center. And something I don't want to see, this is a real pet peeve, my paper contributes to the literature. Look, we don't do this because of the literature, we do this for the knowledge that is within the literature. You're gonna to contribute to knowledge, you're gonna to contribute to understanding, you're not contributing to a literature. You're part of it. Welcome to the family. Okay, that's just a really big pet peeve, but I think it helps us focus on, it's the economics, it's not the economics profession here, right? Like, this is, just tell me what you taught me. Um, and on, on the findings, and I said this before, why these are so important. It's why we do research. It's why we read each other's papers. Take the time to explain them. This is true. This is very much true in the research papers. This is very important when you do your presentations. It, I, I worked at the Federal Reserve for over a decade. I was on hiring committees. I went to countless job talks, interviews, and it broke my heart every time that a job market candidate got within five minutes of the presentation being over and was just starting on their results. And then the results came really, really, really fast. And at the end of the day, more time was spent on the prior literature than was spent on the job market candidate's results. Don't do that to yourself. Make sure that like a third of your talk is you and your results. Um, so, but you're gonna go practice because you're gonna make sure in your paper you spend a lot of time on the results and the findings. Okay, so a few more comments on the abstract and introduction. And this is where I'm kind of telling you how they're a little bit different in the approach here. Okay, so in the abstract, each part, each of those, the first five parts, not the roadmap, the first five parts, each of those parts of the structure is one sentence in the abstract. In the introduction, it's one paragraph. And usually when you go to the body of the paper, one paragraph becomes one section, right? So you should think of this as, you know, we start at the abstract, we go to the intro and we get to the body of the paper. This, this helps with the logical flow. Again, you want to make it easy for the reader, right? So get, get it flowing. Um, one thing that you'll see in the abstract, and I'm going to show you some examples in a minute, and you're going to see these, is the last sentence in the abstract, depending on your topic, could give policy implications, right? Suggest what your findings might imply for a policy debate. In research, we rarely and probably should avoid making a very specific policy prescription, right? As we could give advice on what you think about, it's just, it's more subtle in research papers um, than like the work I do advising policymakers. There, you just gotta, you know, connect the dots, right? Um, but in a research paper, it's about the research, the findings, and less about, what what the policymakers should do. Um, so you you can see one sentence at the end of the abstract. You don't have to do this, and really any other discussion, unless you're you know policy school. Like there are there are exceptions to every rule here, but then the next time in the paper that we should see policy implications is most likely in the conclusion, right? To give it some space. But you know again you know pay attention to how people write in your field your subfield follow that, but that's kind of a general sense of where you'll see policy show up, the connection to the real world show up. Uh, the contribution section, this is probably the most controversial advice I will give you. Uh, the, in my opinion, the contribution sections, these ones that start with, my paper contributes to our understanding of X, so-and-so did this, another so-and-so did that. To me, that is a better structure than doing related literature sections. Okay, but seriously, listen to your advisor. Some people feel strongly about this, some don't. My advisor did not have us do related literature sections. Sometimes towards the end, after the findings, we would have a section um, 
the, had a discussion and there we would put the findings in the context of the literature. But again, people's preference is vary on this. Your advisor is the one that is signing off on your PhD. Do not get your advisor fussy for no good reason. Okay, so, but if you do have a related literature section, make it short, okay? The longer you spend getting to your findings, the, the harder it's gonna be for people to absorb and remember. We get tired, we get tired after reading a lot of pages. And you should remember your job market paper is not what we call a survey paper. When you are much older and you have written like tons and tons of papers, sometimes a journal editor will come to you and say, you have written widely in this particular topic area, for example, minimum wages, summarize the hundreds of papers that are, have been written on minimum wages. That's a survey paper. Don't write a survey paper, right? So you are going to cite research that is most closely related. So you're making a contribution. Sometimes contributions are small, that's okay. You're making a contribution and you're gonna tell me the three, maybe the five papers that are the closest to your contribution. As a little pro tip, somebody in that group is going to end up being one of your referees, right? Like that makes sense. Editors are going to want to know the quality of the paper from people who are very close and deep into that particular research area. The thing in the job market paper is just don't give me 20 people, right? Like the people, the three to five people that are closest and maybe there is the paper that started the whole literature, right? You can go way back. Um, so that's, that's my advice there. Uh, and I see that, I see related literature sections really go off the rails and get long. Um, I'm, I'm there to read your paper, not read theirs. Uh, okay, so like this is all pretty abstract and I talk, well, literally abstract. Uh, you know, I gave you the structure. I think it's extremely important to look at for examples. I have three examples of abstracts here. I'm not gonna spend time going through all these pieces. The slides are gonna be posted. You can look at them in your leisure. Uh, I chose examples from people who write well. Up to, at this point, you have probably read hundreds upon hundreds, like thousands of research papers, at least some portion of them. And you have read up until now for the findings. Right? Like you're trying to learn something, you're a student, you're absorbing all the knowledge that's out there. Okay, so to get really good at writing, it helps to look at the writing of good writers. And when you read the papers, instead of reading for the substance, I mean, do that first, right? Like that's really important. Read it for structure. Right, so what I did here is I've got three abstracts and I went in and kind of diagrammed the abstract. I went and found, where's the question? Where's the contribution, the method, the finding? Okay, now in some of these, I don't find it or maybe the author themselves would be like, oh, no, no, that's not the finding. Um, but in general, I could find them. Uh, this paper by Larry Ball and Greg Mankiw, I, I mean, I'm leading with this example. Greg Mankiw is one of the, best writers in economics, research and um, public writing, regardless of how you feel about his macro, he's really good at writing. And actually I've linked here to writing tips that he has on his blog, they're excellent. You'll see some overlap here. Uh, one little PS for anyone in macro, the point he makes about savings is a stock and saving is an action, learn that one, that like really bugs. Uh, macro people like at the Fed. Um, anyway, so you can see all the pieces are here. This abstract is very clear. You know exactly what he's doing. You know exactly what they found. And you see they stopped at three findings. Okay. So that's a great example. Um, oh, and you can see there's that policy implication hanging out in the last sentence. Uh, another abstract. This again is one that's very simple. This is a methods paper. Methods totally can be a contribution. Uh, you won't be super popular when your contribution is showing that lo some longstanding method like totally doesn't work, but that happens all the time, 
right? That, that's how we learn too. We need to learn what doesn't work the way we thought it did. Um, every coefficient is an estimate of something. We just want to make sure we present it as the estimate of what it actually is the estimate of. Um, so this paper, again, is very clear. It is compact. It gets, we know exactly what this paper is about. We know exactly who needs to read this paper. I also chose this paper. Hillary Hoynes is one of the co-authors. Hillary, editor, top journal, American Economics Review, okay? If, when you go to read for structure, I mean, first I would look for good writers, well-published writers in your subfield, just to get a sense of the style. Anybody who's uh, a top editor at one of the journals, the general interest journals, uh, if you go and read their own papers, uh, they tend to be really well structured. And, and a good hint is Hillary is not going to write a paper, do things in a paper like structurally with the writing that drive her bonkers as a editor, right? Because she has to look at a lot of papers. Right, and so if she has to hunt to find your contribution, if she can't figure out what your method is because it's so convoluted, yeah, that might not make it off her desk, right, to referees. So anyways, but you can learn. This is positive, you can learn, and it's like, this is a really well-written abstract. You know, we can learn from others. She learned too, we all do. Nobody starts out knowing how to do all this. Okay, so the third example for an abstract, Again, you can see this is clear and compact. In <laughs> fancy writing, like lots of words and clauses, this is not going to make your research shine. Keep it simple, right? The research, what you did is complicated. The writing doesn't need to be complicated. The more straightforward it is, the easier it's going to be for readers to digest. You want them to understand what you did. Um, this is another example, and you'll see across the three, there really is no particular order that you have to follow. Like, I like the order of the six pieces that I gave you, but sometimes they just don't work. Sometimes you want to do one thing or another. A lot of times to keep the abstract compact and under word limits for a lot of journals, the motivation won't be here um, in the abstract. The motivate, there's almost always a paragraph at the beginning of an introduction that sets the stage. Um, but you can see things move around here, and sometimes the motivation or the, the contribution and the method are in the same sentence. Um, but anyways, you can see what other people do, and the most important thing is that the contribution and the findings, if they're in there somewhere, and they're clear, because again, they're really, really important. Okay, now that's been about the writing, like the text. Uh, as I said in the beginning, another part of your paper that many, many of the readers will go through are your charts and tables. Okay, so charts, and you should spend time on these, right? And so charts are extremely important. They're as important as words. Uh, we all have heard the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. This is true, and there's more to it. Many people think visually. We often can hold a picture in our head much longer than we can hold, say, a table, a set of numbers. A lot of times we can translate, our, our brain can like translate a table into pictures, like, and then hold it visually. Don't make your reader work, just give them a picture. <laughs> um, and these are hard. I don't, I don't want to make it sound like making what's called the money chart, like your great chart. This, is, this takes time, right? But for your main findings, being able to present it visually in the paper and in your presentation, that pays off. Um, so for both tables and charts, you want to make sure that they are standalone. So like in a table or, or chart, you're gonna have a note at the bottom, a source at the bottom, whatever it is. You need to be, people need to be able to just turn to that page, look at the table, look at the chart, read down it, they totally get it. They get what the finding is. Um, to do that, uh, you need to avoid acronyms, jargon, symbols. 
do not put Greek letters for something that is in an, that is explained in an equation five pages before. It's fine to use the Greek letters if you want to, but they should come after the words, the label of the thing, right? Because I'm not going to, even if I read your equation, and remember, not all readers are going to go through the full text. I am not going to remember it, okay? So don't do that. If you have to put an acronym up in the chart, in the note to the chart, write it out. Um, personally, I try to avoid acronyms throughout the paper and come up with short label words. Acronyms are exclusive. People often, they don't know them. And if you make up an acronym, people will forget it like less than a page later. Um, so again, just be clear. That's, this is a, a, a basic principle. Now, uh, take some time with tables and charts. Uh, if you don't take time with them, you will forget things that are important, like the labels for the axis. What am I, what am I looking at here? Uh, and I talked to an editor about this and she was like, you have no idea how common that is. You know, like you just, you forget. I mean, we all forget stuff sometimes. Anyway, so make sure you've labeled the axes. Use fonts that are big enough, right? Feel sorry for us who are old and eyes are failing us. Um, you, you, again, you want to, people to be able to understand what you're doing. And if you're doing it visually, they gotta be able to see it. Uh, one thing, and this is becoming less and less important, but again, some of us are old, print out your paper once in black and white and see if, you know, the lines are distinguishable from each other. If they're all shades of gray and all about the same shade, it's going to be really hard for someone who printed it out, got on the airplane and just, you know, can't figure it out. I mean, use color in your paper. Most people now are reading them electronically, but just, just to be safe. Um, it also disciplines you from using too many lines, right? Like once you get up above three lines, it gets really hard, right? The goal night is not to make spaghetti uh, in charts. Okay, very important. All right, so I'm also gonna give you some examples of charts. As it so happens, the three examples are going to be charts that I and my co-authors have used in papers. Uh, I take a lot of pride in the chart work that I do. Uh, it's important. I I think visually, I think they just look nice. It's like part of being proud of your work is presented in a way that it looks good. Uh, and, it, and it gets the results across. So this first one is from a paper with um, Adi Aladangadi, Shipper Arendine, Wendy Dunn, Laura Fiveson, Paul Langerman, and myself. Those are all my esteemed colleagues that I missed dearly at the Federal Reserve. Uh, this was a paper we developed the data, years, uh, a daily retail sales spending series with geographic detail. One of the ways that we use this to present information, just give information to the Federal Open Market Committee as they were in a policy meeting is we were tracking Hurricane Harvey and Irma in real time, showing the effect on uh, retail spending as those hurricanes hit. So landfall is the dash, the vertical dash line. Now, what you can see in this chart, so this could have been a table, right? These are coefficient estimates, those are the dots, and the standard errors, error band, are the shaded areas. We could have put this in a table. You would have had the same numbers, you'd know where they were big, where they were small, is really compelling in a chart, right? This tells the picture so fast. Um, so that's just an example of you can take tables and make them into charts. And that, especially for like your main result can really work well. Okay, so another one, this is, you know, in any of our papers, we have summary statistics and sometimes people will present data one way, but there might be another where it's really compelling. This was a chart I used recently on a Substack post within five minutes of it coming up, an editor at the Financial Times asked if they could use it in one of their publications. That's a good chart. <laughs> um, one of the things this chart shows, and John Schwabish, who's at the Urban Institute, has just wonderful resources on how to uh, visually communicate uh, economic research. I recommend his books, his podcasts, like you can buy his chart pack, like just 
John knows how to do this. This is very much in the style that he recommends for uh, economic analysis that's geared towards a more general audience. So one of the things that you'll see in this chart, which really isn't quite kosher in economic research, though I really think it should be, um, is that that headline, this keep today's rise uh, in perspective, the figure head explains what I want you to see in the figure. Uh, the second line, this price index for consumer durable goods, that would be much more typical for the title of a chart. Like you tell us what I'm looking at not what I'm supposed to see. Um, I agree with John. I think it's just, it, it gets to the point so much more quickly. Um, but again, there are norms. Pay attention. You are not, as a junior person, here to change economics. You will do that over the course of your career, but you don't have to do it out of the gate. Pay attention to how people do stuff, formatting stuff. Um, but with charts and writing, do it better than the typical paper. Um, so. Uh, okay, so here's here's a third example of a chart. This this is also one where I've taken what were kind of painstaking quantitative estimates that I did. This is the um, the effect of spending out of the fourteen hundred dollars stimulus checks using estimates from a survey that I ran on how much of the checks and how quickly people spend them, and this is putting the contributions in uh, consumer spending growth at a quarterly rate. Um, this there is a table that lives that created these numbers, and but to present it. And frankly, I would do this in a research paper also. It really helps to do it visually so you can really see what's going on and you don't have to hold a bunch of numbers in your head. Um, you know, there are some details that get lost in figures, put the table in the appendix, right? Like you, you can put more detail in your paper, but just don't clog up the, um, the main part of the paper with details that people are frankly not going to be able uh, to absorb. Um, on tables, be really cognizant of how many numbers are in the table. Like you very, very, very rarely need three decimal places. Um, just be mindful when you look at the table, are people going to be overwhelmed or are they going to see your main result, right? Again, make it easy for the reader. Let your results shine, right? It's just a basic principle. There's a lot of ways you'll find to do it. Um, you know, and spend some time on it. Not all the time, most of the papers on the research. Okay, we're getting close to the end here. Uh, so other general writing tips, and these, these really broadly apply. Okay, so stick to the facts, right? Avoid subjective words such as surprising, important, obvious. What is surprising to you? or even the typical person in your field might not be surprising to me. Uh, this particularly happens when you get to the referee point. Like you got people that are really deep in your area. It's very rare that I referee a paper when they tell me it's surprising, I think it's surprising. <laughs> Sometimes I think it's wrong. Um, but so just, just do the facts. You don't have to be subjective. You don't have to do value judgments. Um, sometimes you might, but just very sparingly, okay? Um, and also limit adverbs, right? Like just, and this goes to the concise. If you look at a sentence, it's like really long. There's almost certainly places where you can chop it into two sentences and there are words that aren't doing you any good, right? So delete. Um, and when you're talking about your economic findings, focus on the economic significance. Remember we are doing economics. Do not dwell on the statistical significance. Now, in your tables or in your charts, you need to convey uh, the precision of your results. So statistical significance, if you are doing empirical work, is going to be important, right? Like you need to get those facts written down somewhere in the paper. And when you are talking, when you are highlighting key results, have them be economically significant and statistically, right? Like don't, I mean, sometimes we convey, well, you know, the, the effect was positive, but um, imprecisely estimated, or 
you know, some like you can give us a result because we're going to want to know the number and you can be clear. Well, actually, that number doesn't tell us that much. It, it could be zero. It could be not. Um, so you can convey that, but don't do uh, GDP rose by 4% and the effect is st statistically significant. Just tell me the result about GDP. Because um, we're doing economics, right? So just focus. Um, and well, and, and this also, uh, you'll hear this brought up some, the research paper is you sharing your knowledge. You're not sharing your journey, right? Because anyone who's done empirical work, you know, the reality is even if you set ahead of time very firmly what you were going to investigate and how you were gonna set up your specification, this is best practice, you should do this, there are going to be times where you run the regression, you're just like, please, please be different from zero statistically. Okay, so, but like, don't do that happy dance in the paper, right? Like, that was a good day. I'm sure there were some bad ones. Um, but you really like just focus on the results and focus on the economics, focus on the knowledge. Um, okay, that's important. And Okay, this is a this is kind of a neat tip about structure. Because remember I told you in the abstract it's a sentence, in the introduction it's a paragraph, and then it becomes like a section in the paper. So I heard this from an editor, and, and actually I've heard this from a person who like coaches professional writing more broadly and from a journal editor. So this is great. Okay, so it some people will think of paragraphs as building blocks, and I like this, right? And so a paragraph should have a point like it should make one point um and so the first sentence of the paragraph will tell us that main point and the rest of the paragraph will back it up okay if a paragraph has two points you have two paragraphs right two big points um and so what you can do to see if you have done this is starting with the introduction or, or you can do this in the body of the paper read the first sentence of every paragraph one after another, does that tell your story? Like, does it flow logically? Is there something missing? Did you hide a important sentence as a point inside of a paragraph instead of at the top? Uh, the editor that told me about this said that this is one way that she reads a paper really quickly. Like, gonna read the abstract carefully, the introduction carefully, and then is another quick take, sentence, 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 sentence. Um, so I don't know, it's just, it's, I think it's a good way just to check your, your structure. Again, good structure leads to your communication, right? This, this really can help you. Okay, now this is a lot of advice. Writing is hard, it takes time. You have a lot of other things to get done before you submit the paper or go on the job market. Uh, so buddy up, right? Get feedback from other people. Uh, trade drafts with someone not in your field. That's a good way, because remember, they're not gonna be the subject matter expert. You're gonna have people on the committee that aren't subject matter experts. Trade with them. Uh, and then get back together and be like, did you understand my abstract? Introduction, tables of charts. Have them explain your paper back to you. If what you hear back is not what you meant to said, go fix the writing, okay? This is really good. I think it can also be helpful um, you know, if you're a non-native English speaker, maybe trade with an English speaker, vice versa. I want to be really clear that um, being a non-native English speaker is not necessarily to your detriment. Um, I, I mean, let's face it, economists, we are not selected into the profession because we're good writers, right? Some of us sneak in, but like, <laughs> it's not... It's not the main criteria. It's much, it's very quantitative science and a lot of departments, not all, like they're looking for those skills and those skills aren't always um, matched up with good writing. Okay, so I have, like I said, I have read dozens and dozens of papers um, from schools all over the world, you know, ones you've heard of, ones you maybe haven't. Okay, they're in all cases, and this it happens for me too, we can improve our writing. Um, and honestly, I give as many comments on native English speakers as non-native. Um, and sometimes a non-native English speaker is, uses more straightforward um, 
sentences shorter, clearer, and that actually has a real benefit. Um, some native English speakers get real excited about clauses, and then you've got like really long sentences. Um, so we all have things that we have to work on. It's not, um, y'all can do this. It just takes time, but you can do it. Um, but anyways, this like trading drafts, this is really good. Those of you on the job market, you know, help each other, support each other. Uh, another important conversation is to talk with your advisor, like have this as an actual conversation to make sure that like we're all on the same page. You explain, you do this in words. It may be nice if they read your paper, but do it in words. Here's what I think my contribution is from this paper. Here are what I think are the key findings. Make sure they agree. Yes, I agree that's your contribution. With contributions in particular, they may have a better sense of where your paper adds to our understanding than you do because they've been, they've been around longer, right? So your advisor can, will, I'm sure in many cases, help you refine your contribution. That's important. So that's an important conversation to have. On the findings, it's really important that you two are aligned on what you found because one of the important things that your advisor will do and your committee members will do on the job market is write a letter about how awesome you are. And part of the awesomeness they're going to convey is your job market paper. Um, so it's good if they understand your paper and you all are on the same page. Um, okay, so that's good. And, you know, I gave you a lot of advice. This can be kind of overwhelming. You have a whole career to refine your skills as an economist. Your job market paper will not be the best paper you write or the best analysis. Maybe you don't write more research papers, but this, this is not since the beginning of your journey as a professional economist, economist with a PhD, this is not the end of it. So writing is hard, it does pay off. It is not a gift, right? In the, like, it's not like you, you've got the, this, you know, I'm a writer or I'm not a writer. It's a, it's a practice. I mean, honestly, some people start out and they're better at writing, but it, this is basic, good, clear communication is something that anyone can achieve with some work and some time. So again, this is not where you should spend bulk of your time on your paper. They have to be technically sound. The findings have to be um, interesting. I mean, they, they have, they're going to add in some way to what we understand, but set aside some time, you know, clean up, particularly your abstract and your intro. This is not a two hour activity, but it's really not probably more than a two week activity. And that's not like constant, right? Trade the papers, do the different things. Um, but give yourself a little bit of time. Any bit you, any little bit you can do will distinguish you, um, you know, writing's hard and, and it takes time. So don't don't feel like you got to do all this right out of the gate. Uh, if push comes to shove, you know, your main findings, like that's where you should get the work. But if you're at the point where you're working on like the third robustness check or, or some footnote on page 30, put it down for a little bit and fix the introduction. Um, so that's... You know, hard work pays off. You know that. You've been doing the PhD. Now you have this research, you know all this stuff. Share it and share it well. All right. So now I'm going to move into the macro mom mentoring to take us on home. Uh, be proud of yourself and your work. Especially those of you finishing your PhDs, you should be really proud of what you have accomplished. And more broadly, just remember, science is not a zero-sum game. We all stand on the shoulders of giants. The giants, they stood on other giants' shoulders before them, right? Like, this is, a, science is a collaborative effort. Sometimes it might feel competitive, but it's really we're all pushing the frontier out, right? We got to do this together. No one person can do it all, right? So you have... You have made contributions and you have future contributions to make. Like you're you're right in there with it. Okay. So that's again, be proud, be proud of who you are and what you have to add to the profession. Now, I do a lot of mentoring of graduate students, and frankly, 
the the thing that is hardest for me to see is the extent to which um, graduate school really breaks down a lot of people. Now it's really hard. The transition from being a student and consuming knowledge to being a scholar and producing knowledge that that is legitimately hard. Right, like no matter how supportive departments are, that's a tough transition. It's just, it's like a different part of your brain. Like it's just a different role. So, okay, that's gonna be hard. I do think that economics fails its students with, in some cases, a very hyper competitive environment, um, too much emphasis on what journal your paper gets published in, too much emphasis on whether you end up being a mini of your professor at a particular school or a particular job. Um, remember, it's your life, right? So you get to decide what you do next. Um, but the thing, and it's only, I can see this when I read the job market papers, even if I have ideas about, you know, move this paragraph, structure this, economics is really good. You have spent years investing in your skills you know so much more as you leave a PhD program than when you started. And you all are the cutting edge of economics. Nobody in the profession gets to spend as much time as you have on building your skills, okay? We need you, <laughs> we need your ideas and your voices. Like you all really are at the front line of pushing the frontier. I don't, a lot of the students I talk to, I don't feel like they understand that, like how, how teched up they are. Um, so own that, you earned it. You're the cutting edge, that's you. Just remember that. It's not always gonna feel like that, but it is, it's the truth, right? You, you really do know a lot and, and that's good. You're gonna share it with us. You're gonna do good things. One other thing that I see, and I think this relates to graduate school beating us down um, and this doesn't, sometimes ends with graduate school. Like we do have to kind of figure out a way to operate in the culture that, you know, is the way it is. Uh, no research is definitive. No research answers all questions. You never get the perfect data set. You never have identification that is like totally clean. I guarantee your referees will find the thing that like isn't totally clean about it. That's okay. That's how science is. Like if there was a paper and it was one and done, we could all just pack it up, right? Research continues, there's always gonna be another question. And so when I read your paper, do not apologize for what you did not do. Do not apologize for what your data set is not. Focus on what you did, focus on what you had as tools. Like what did you add? Like keep it positive, like you should be. This is about being proud of your work, right? Like tell me what you did. You, I know this is hard after years of working on it, you need to be excited about your work. If you are not excited and you don't share that excitement, it's rare for other people to create it for you, right? So find that, channel it. I'm excited about your work. It's so awesome to get to read these job market papers before the rest of the world does. Like I learn a lot and I'm just reading for the writing, right? So like really. You're awesome. Okay, so I will close it up now with two moments of Zen. Uh, these are the first one and this, so the quality of your paper is orthogonal to the quality of your person. Okay, so for our non-wonky people who've gotten this far, that just means that you're just, if you write a great paper, that doesn't mean you're a great person. It doesn't tell me anything about your person. And vice versa, if you have a paper that just flops, and we all do, everybody's got a paper that they worked on, it didn't work, and it got shelved. Um, so if you have a paper that's not a good paper, it doesn't mean that you're not a good person. Now, what this does mean though, is you gotta work at both. Like a good paper doesn't make a good person per se. Right, we take our work very personally. It is hard, I know this, anybody knows this, when one of our papers is cr criticized, it's hard not to take it personally. It's not personal. Um, you gotta do both, you gotta work on the paper, work on the person. And this, uh, John DiNardo, who was a professor at University of Michigan, who 
passed away far too young uh, and was just an absolute joy of a professor. So this was something that he told his students on the job market. And I think it's exactly the kind of thing you need to tell yourself somewhere between first round interviews and flyouts. Like there's a moment where everybody needs to know this. Um, and then my words, last one, and putting on my macro mom hat, be kind to yourself, okay? The job market is hard. Be kind to yourself and just remember life is a marathon, not a sprint, right? The job market is not the end of your career, it's the beginning. So pace yourself. Uh, and be kind to yourself and also be kind to others, right? Again, this is a tough time. Economics is gonna be better for this job market season. You all getting out there, finding um, your next intellectual home, but I want you all to get to the finish line with a smile on your face. <laughs> so um, anyway, so I've got, you know, that's the end of the talk for today. I've given you a lot of substance. I've given you hopefully some encouragement. Uh, and I just really appreciate you taking the time to listen to what the advice I have. And if you have any questions, if you have any feedback for me, uh, send me an email. So, all right, well, thank you everybody and all the best with the, the research that you're doing.